doctor took the loaves and the fishes and he blessed them and it was his action that produced the manifestation. There was no manifestation until the loaves were started to be broken. There was no manifestation until the fishes were started to be broken. And there will be no manifestation of the power of God that God has promised in your life until you act. Takaba Sangaraba. I said, until you act. Yes, faith is a fact. But faith is an action. My God. are not living in the days of the one and the two seats and the three seats. You are living in the hour. You trust me, I may be in heaven. I'm not sure how long God will keep me on this earth. This is my 75th anniversary of ministry. You may be seen. Thank you. I'm not so sure. I was talking to Mama on the phone. She told me to tell you and Pastor Chris and all the wonderful ministers here to give her love to you. She's been with me in Nigeria scores of times. She's been with me in England. to talk to uh, uh, Richard Dawkins or anyone, they would be that empirical being, from a rational being to an empirical being. But then life went along and all of a sudden the metaphysicians came along and said, you know what, what does this do for metaphysics? What does this do for certainty about philosophical statements? And so nihilism and despair came into being, a la Frederick Nietzsche and so on. You cannot have any sense of ultimate meaning because you can never be certain of any metaphysical statements. You can never be certain of any philosophical statements. They were all subjectively driven. But then came along the existentialists and said, we have to find meaning. We have to find meaning in the face of despair. And they were pulling themselves up by their volitional bootstraps in the face of despair. I am going to disavow all the despair around me and find my own individualized meaning and purpose. And so came uh, the existentialists like Sartre and Camus and the others, and they found the way into the human psyche not so much through argumentation as the logical positivists or the uh, uh, rationalists would have done. They were finding it through drama, literature, the movies, and the arts. So rather than coming to the front door of reason, they came to the back door of imagination. And the whole idea of will, purpose, emotion, fulfillment, the existentialists took over from the 60s onwards and so many of the young that were produced at that time did not believe in absolutes anymore. They only believed in a volitional expression of you finding yourself. Um, 
God created the world in six days. Trevor, I have forgotten you. You sit right here in front. Trevor Thompson from South Africa. He is a great, great uh, international musician with his wife Patricia. I, I love and honor you in the Lord. Thank you so much for coming. Amen. God created the world in six days. And after six days, he saw that everything was very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. There's only one thing that wasn't good. And that was that Adam had no wife. Okay, are you hearing me? That was the only thing that wasn't good. And that was corrected. So, Adam and Eve now in the Garden of Eden. The Lord celebrated his day of rest, also called Sabbath. God had his Sabbath. Rest did not mean that um, he was exhausted. God is never exhausted. He's almighty. He's almighty. Some people think they have to pray to help God. But I can assure you, God is almighty without your assistance. Isn't he? When he wants us to pray, is that he wants to connect us with his plans. I will be done. Your kingdom come. I don't want to lose my red thread now. I could go off like a rocket and end any time. <laughs> he said, I've got a little daughter at home. She's sick. She's dying. And there's nothing we can do. Jesus immediately said, I will come and heal her. But while he was heading towards Jerry's house, he was intercepted by the woman with the issue of blood. And that miracle took time. And by the time Jesus got to Jairus' house, all of Jairus' friends, his religious leaders, were standing at the door waiting for him to come with the healer. And they cried to Jairus, no need for you to bring that healer in here because your daughter's dead. It's too late. There's a lot of boo-hooing and crying and tears and oh my, if the Lord had only been on time. And Jesus looked at them and he said, don't you remember? I said, I will come and heal her. He turned his back on all of those religious leaders that came to cry. The healer got here too late. And those religious leaders were getting on Jarius and saying, you trusted in the master. You're going to hear this, beloved. And your daughter is dead. How are you ever?
never going to face all of your religious leaders. They're going to criticize you. They're going to say, you went and ran after the healer, and it didn't do you any good. Your daughter's dead. I can see the master, oh my lord. Turned his back on those negative forces of unbelief. He said, I told you I came here to heal her. Take me to her. She's upstairs underneath the sheet. And Jesus takes his hand and he puts it underneath the sheet. And he says, Daughter, I say unto thee, Arise. All of a sudden the sheet moves. My God, and that girl. Adam was the first man. He failed. So God tried it again. He took another man, Abraham. Abraham, the father, our father of faith, we are connected with this word of the Old Testament. We are engrafted in that stump. We are profiting from the Old Testament which Jesus fulfilled for us. And now we are in the new covenant. This is the new covenant in his blood. Amen. The new covenant in his blood. The old one is fulfilled and we are now floating and rejoicing and working and praising the Lord in the new covenant. Isn't that wonderful? So, we have a seeking God. We have a seeking God. He seeks. And we were all found. That is... With my, my understanding, it's, it's the greatest context it's the greatest context. There are other facets, there are lots of facets. But then, you know, this is so intimately and intricately connected with Calvary and with the, with the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that it is so central. Don't underestimate evangelism, the Great Commission. Preach the gospel to those who don't know it. Who don't know it. I met evangelists and I never would have thought they were evangelists. Because they, they had a mom and pop ministry. They went to churches and had a jolly good time. I'm not looking down on them, please, don't get me wrong. One thing, just the one thing about the Christian message that no other worldview espouses. You take all of the pantheistic worldviews, take all of the, uh, any other monotheistic worldview, and here's what's so, so unique about the Christian faith. Grace, salvation in the Christian faith, only worldview where this is a gift. In every other worldview, you earn it. You earn it either through karma or you earn it by your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds. This idea of grace and the gift of an all-righteous God so puzzled even Martin Luther. He came to a point every time he saw the phrase, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God, he said, I came to a point of almost hating him. Because it was like setting up a mirror, but not giving you any water with which to wash your face. Just telling you how wretched it was the reality, but no hope. 
He said, until the day dawned on him that righteousness was a gift, the grace of God was a gift, salvation was a gift. Understand the differences, it is key, how the gathering storm of religious pluralism. Thirdly and quickly, the power to inform through the visual. We now have become less in our reading and more in our viewing. Less in our reading and more in our viewing. We say sometimes a picture is better than a thousand words. Maybe, but not always. Sometimes a word is better than a thousand pictures. What do I mean by that? Alexander Pope, describing the conversion of water into wine, had this one line. The conscious water saw its master and blushed. The conscious water saw its master and blushed. What an incredible reality is set before you and me in that marvelous world. You can see picture after picture after picture, but all of a sudden you hear that voice. You say, it's so good to hear from you. Behind the glory of God is the voice of God, but it's the burning bush of the transfiguration, or the baptism, or the book of Ezekiel, where the glory of God dwelt, where the voice of God was also heard. And so, what was it William Blake said about the eyes, this life's dim windows of the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and goads you to believe a lie when you see with or not through the eye. We are intended to see through the eye with the conscience. Through the eye and with the conscience. But a lot of our viewing today is with the eye and devoid of a conscience. The truth of the matter is the eyes and the ears both have a place and the mind is what holds it all together. So I leave with you just those three changes and maybe just one more. Anybody ready to step into your destiny? Let me tell you what destiny is. It's a preconceived action whether you will understand this or not, it is true. God has every one of our lives planned. 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 The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Three minutes. Oh my Lord, my God. I want to put the secret in your hands. I want to put the key in your hands. I don't want to just promise you something. I want to show you how to get it. I want to show you how to walk out of this conference equipped that all power, all authority, which was given unto Jesus, is now given to you. All power, all authority. Somebody shout all. Jesus is on the hillside. A great multitude of innumerable amount of people have come to this hillside and every house of the enemy's hold 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when the last enemy is out, that is the time to celebrate. Hallelujah. 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 Don't forget that. We celebrate sometimes when we just have caught a mouse. We need to get the devil out. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Another thing about evangelism. I heard people say, we have to protect the gospel. We have to protect the gospel. Because there are so many who attack the gospel. So we have to defend, defend. I know the word defend uh, 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 is in, in scripture, but not in this sense. The opposite is true. And what is the opposite? We do not defend the gospel with razor wire to keep the people away from it because we have to protect its genuineness, its truth and all that. The gospel is best defended when it is exposed to its enemies. That is the best. Why? Because the gospel knows through the Spirit of God how to tackle those enemies. Hallelujah. And only when the gospel is preached, really preached, Enemies of God become the friends of God. Isn't that true? Oh, I love the word of God. I tell you, the, the, I love the word of God. I love the word of God. Let me say something more. Heart and the Savior of the world and his love with his extended arms being offered to you. May I suggest to you, it wasn't the violence that bothered them, it was the message behind it. It is so critical that we understand how suffering ministers to people, how uh, when you enable them. I remember I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, and a guy stood up from one of the African countries there, and he said, you know, my country has suffered, we've been at war with each other, so much is going on. What do you have to say to me? And I looked at him and I said, you know what? If I pretended to give you a one-line answer as the ultimate solution of all the time we have, you will be offended. But if there is a one-line answer, it would be this. Only a wounded savior can minister to a wounded nation. Only a wounded savior can minister to a wounded nation. And he just looked at me and he said, out what the cross really means. So there it is, the apologetic that is not merely heard but seen. Number two, an apologetic that's not merely argued but also felt. You have to have the conviction of this truth. See, an opinion, an opinion is what you hold. A conviction is what holds you. An opinion is what you possess. Conviction is what possesses you. You may have an opinion that blue is better than green. Ten years later, you may say, actually, I don't like either blue or green. I prefer white. You can go to any color at that point. But you're not really changing who you are. You're just changing your preferences in a continuum. But if you change your conviction, you're changing who you are. A conviction is what binds you together in the soulishness of your life and mine. And that's why Jesus, looking at the cross, said, if there's any other way, nevertheless, my will with yours be done. 
That's why Saul, heading to Rome, he knew that persecution, death, and awaited, awaited him. But he reminded himself that this was the purpose in which God had brought him into the world to get to let the message to the Caesars. Henceforth, no, let no man trouble me, because I bear on my body the marks of the Lord. I desire to know nothing amongst men save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You take that conviction, put it into your heart. You take that soul-gripping reality, and you will be a person who speak with conviction. Men and women will say of you, Truly believe. And he found out how to produce light. And we got the electric light through breakthrough. Now, I could stand up here by the hour, but I'm not an hour preacher. Usually 15, 20 minutes. So I've already passed that. Whether it was Ford with the automobile, or whether it was Wright with the airplane, they all came up against the wall of resistance. And all truth is parallel. They in the natural broke through. How? By suddenly they got a burst of advanced knowledge. They got an entrance into understanding something that they never understood before. Oh yes. Pastor likes to use and quote Mars that all truth is parallel. It is because this is the hour of incredible breakthrough for the pastor, for the evangelist, for the body of Christ. This is your time. This is our time. Now is the time for breakthrough. There is no wall of resistance that can hold back the power, the glory, the manifestation of the God that we serve! But one thing is, I would like you to hear. Some people think they had this idea that people should be saved. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God had spun. At Calvary. God is not joining our plans, we are joining His plan. He is not just uh, depending on us, He has makes the greatest effort for heaven to be full and hell to be empty. And this is what we do when we preach the gospel. You may know that line of mine. Plundering hell to populate heaven. Amen. It's a transfer from lostness to being saved forever. Amen. And that's why evangelism is a holy compulsion. It's a holy compulsion. It's not what we just do now. Oh, yes, uh, it's time to go now. Uh, one, once a month or what? To go from house to house or have an open air meeting or what? It's all fine if you do that at least once a month. <laughs> but I tell you, when it's a compulsion, I understand the word compulsion. You can't, you, you can, just can't sit. 
You can't sin. You've got to get up like Isaiah. What I like about Isaiah is this. He overheard two persons in the Trinity speaking to each other. We know who they were. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah heard it in the temple. When Isaiah heard that, I think if I had been Isaiah, may God forbid me, I would have said, Lord, what do you have in mind? Isaiah never asked. I cannot find him. But then he starts asking a series of questions. Who gave us the power to do this thing? How did we wipe away the entire horizon? Is there any up or down left? Will not lanterns now have to be lit in the morning hours? Will we now suddenly have to invent some sacred games to bring some kind of appeasement to the drive of the sacred? You know, uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, the great conservative commentator, passed away just a couple of days ago. And if you read Krauthammer's belief on the supernatural and so on, he said he really didn't know what to believe. He didn't know whether the popularized versions of religion were true or not. He couldn't figure it out. But he was sure of this thing. The most implausible of all of the worldviews, said he, is atheism. He said, I simply cannot accept the atheistic paradigm. He said, there is too much of reality that is unexplained by that. He was known for being a decent man, an honest man, and a very wise commentator on things. So while he did not know which way to turn as far as the belief in God was concerned, he knew which way not to turn. And that was because it had its limited answers. And so the atheistic worldview though is growing in popularity. And that's why the questions that are being raised have fewer and fewer answers all the time. Ask any university student, what does it mean to be human? You will probably get as many different answers as the individuals you talk to. If we don't know what it means to be human, how do we know what the imperatives should be for humanism? What is the ism that assumes what the human being is all about? And so we lived through that horrific 20th century when what happened was that the Third Reich and the entire Nazi experiment took Friedrich Nietzsche's paradigm